anyway so good to see you all and uh, i i have checked your name one by one and who uh, and uh, but anyway well today i'm going to share about rose worker and uh, uh, not only for a uh, sermon but anyway so let's uh, read the bible first and we i'm going to share uh, this Bible verse for two session continuously. So can we all uh, look together? Gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 50, uh, Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verse 57. So if you don't have uh, your own Bible, you can read together with this uh, uh, screen, with my screen, okay. Anyway. Uh, chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nets, but the Son of Man has no place to lay down his head. Verse 59. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to them, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 61, still another said, I will follow you. Lord, let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and the look back is fit for serv service in the kingdom of God. Chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Well, uh, today is going to be very practical uh, subject I'm going to mention. And uh, as I understood, all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, you are there, you as a foreign students. It's now stuck in again, um, just a minute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, now let let go back. So the you all of us, you are now there studying theological seminary, expecting to become a pastor or leader or missionary in the future. Well. Uh, that's why I want to apply this word to each and every one of you to check out, to uh, examine yourself. Uh, this time I'm going to really raise this question. Uh, yeah. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I mean, this is very important, very critical question and very uh, fundamental question. Who is Jesus to you? Other words, so you are there uh, to study theological seminary. And uh, today the person, one man, come to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And uh, this very basic uh, kind of uh, attitude, then 
he expressed that he's, he's ready to follow Jesus Christ. Then Jesus, to, before he accepted this man to become his follower, Jesus wants to make sure one thing. Who am I to you? Jesus wants to know what was the motivation of this man? Why he want to follow me? Why do you want to follow me? In other words, do you know? Do you really know who am I? Do you really know who I am? Who am I to you? And the same questions you are there, you are there in Chongxin University, Chongxin Seminary, and the Jesus raising same question to you. Who am I to you? And the other words, Jesus replied to him. Jesus reply was something very strange. Jesus replied, he, this man asked him, Jesus, I will follow you. But Jesus replied, foxes have a hole and birds of the air have a net, but the son of man has no place to lay down, he said. Now, Jesus wants to really make sure the motivation of this man. Why, he want, why do you want to follow me? What is your motivation? And there's the same question goes to each and every one. And uh, those who want to become servants of Christ or workers of Christ. What is your motivation? And the you, maybe some of you, you just recommended by somebody or you just applied by yourself, find the seminary in Korea and you, you just came all the way from your home country, and you are there. And then first, before you just go for complete your study, whatever, and then you just examine yourself, what was your motivation to be there? Because I, the reason I'm asking this very, in a sense, very, very ridiculous question. But nowadays, quite some people, we have experienced some people, they came to Korea or they came to US, but their motivation, they said they want to become servant of Christ. They said they want to follow Jesus Christ, but sometimes their motivation was quite, quite you know, uncertain. And Jesus tried to make this man, you know, to understand what that means to follow Jesus Christ. He said, even the foxes of the field, they have a, the, net, the you know, holes and birds of the air have a net. But son of man, which is Jesus, I have no place to lay down. My head means Jesus doesn't have anything what this man was expected. We don't know the Bible, whether this man eventually followed Jesus or he just turned back and they, you know, left. We don't know, the Bible did not say. But this simple question applies to you and to me, all of us. Who am I to you? Who Jesus is to you? Who is Jesus to you? That is a question. I mean, the reason I'm asking, without having this, this matter clearly, you know, clearly determined, even you did your three years study or four years studies, that can be nothing, they can be in vain. So before you go further, before you study, before you, whatever you do, you have to check, you have to examine yourself. What is my motivation? to be here. And that today, Jesus keep raising this question. You know, Jesus was keep raising this question again and again. Who is, who am I to you? Jesus keep asking, who am I to you? And uh, now Jesus, the reason why Jesus make this question, he want clarify the Lordship now, you and me, we call Jesus our Lord. Our, he is our, Jesus is our Lord. We are his servant. Otherwise, we are his workers. And uh, Jesus is our Lord. We are his servant. So then 
That's why even this man, he won't follow Jesus Christ, but Jesus won't make sure, do you really know who am I? Do you really know who I am? Do you, do you really know the, your motivation, why you want to follow me? You know, the, Jesus, maybe because when the time Jesus, you know, move, moving here and there, and he performed miracles, and he raised the dead, you know, dead person to give life, and he opened the, the blind men, and uh, he just healed the lames and the paralyzed people. And uh, he fed five bread and two fish for 1,000 people, or 5,000 people. And all these kind of miracles, what Jesus performed, this man, he watched it. Maybe he thought, if I follow him, maybe in the future, he will become king or he will become an emperor of this, this nation. Then I will become one of his men. Maybe that could be his motivation. We don't know. Bible did not say exactly why. But anyway, we can even, we can assume, we can assume that what was his purpose? And then through the Bible, we can understand the context. What was the, the, that, that man's motivation? And then today, Jesus keeps saying that in between he and his workers' relationship as a lordship, he is the Lord, we are his servant. And even when you go to uh, chapter 10, he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Harvest, we know the harvest, what men, what the what harvest meant. But harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then next word, ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, this is somehow to make to to make you understand more clearly well when as i see you people i don't know anybody missed it here but uh, as i see the joy joy where are you now can i can i see you joy i don't see joy's face and uh yeah. I can see Sunil Kumar. I, I saw him, Sunil. And then I don't know who that person is. She's a Korean, or Yumi. She, she looked like Korean. Yumi and uh, Arun. Arun, okay. Esther, where is Esther? Esther is here. Okay, I anyway. I don't, the, the picture. But anyway, you are somewhere. You are somewhere, good. And uh, Daniel, I saw him. And then Charija, who is Charija? Charija? Chari Charija? Or Celestine? Yeah, Celestine? I'm here, I'm here. Okay, Charija, you are there, okay. Vinita. Are you there? Vinita. Oh. And... Uh, Kekin, Kekinna. Did I pronounce correctly? Kekin. Anyway, so 11 of you or 12 of you, you, all of you, you went for one day picnic in Korea. Now in Korea, it's a season for, you know, the apple. This is apple, actually. This is apple palm. As I, as I understand, Korean apple is one of the best apple in the world. That cannot be, com I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I've been in many countries, but the, certainly Korean apple is the best, I would say. Now, it's a, now soon, in, in, within Two months time, you will see the apple palm like this in Korea, everywhere. Apple in Korea, you will see apple, Korean apple palms. So this is apple palms. It's a beautiful, delicious. Korean apple is very, very delicious. Now, on the way, you're on the way for your one day picnic. You saw the apple palm. You realized, wow, this apple is ripened. 
ripe. Is it well ripe? It's correct. You see, this is well ripe, delicious apple. And then now, wow, this is apple. Then all of you jump into the this apple farm and they start to pick the apple apples because it's ripe. Just go into and pick the apples. What will happen next? What will happen next, Arun? Farmer will beat you. <laughs> yeah, you will be found in police station, considered as a theft, you know, because this is not your farm. Even the apple is ready to pick, ready to harvest, but that is not your farm. There's somebody's, but you can go and you can pick it under that con condition. What condition? Permission from the owner. Owner says, okay, you can come and you can go into my apple farm and then pick as much as you can, then you can pick it. But without having that permission, if you go, well, apple is ripe. But even though that all apples are ripe, but you are not allowed to pick any of them because that is not yours without having permission from the owner of that farm, you cannot get it. Now, Jesus tried to say, you try to teach us to send out workers into his harvest field. We are his worker. He wants us to go into his harvest field. That is, between you and Jesus, our relationship, Lord and servant. He's our Lord, we are his servant. So we suppose go, wherever we do, wherever we do, wherever we go, we are supposed to go, the Lord Jesus send out, send us into his harvest field. Now, let me give you easy, you know, example. So if you go to uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus sent the workers to every town and place where he himself was about to go. That is actually uh, what the Bible says. Every town and every place, yes, servant, they can go, but the owner, Jesus himself, he sent them every place, every town where Jesus himself was about to go. So, well, let me give you easy example. This man is a Mr. BKU, is a farmer. I have a big, big farm, couple of farms, huge farms. One, one farm located in and in, 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 anyways, I need the, I need the harvest workers. So I employed 11 workers, 11 laborers, all those people I employed. And uh, also I, 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 I based in Yangji and all those people you are employed for my field, for my farm. So I gave you uh, some uh, instruction. This is cherry. We know cherry, you know cherry. Uh, cherry is very delicious fruit, very sweet fruit. We like it anyway, cherry. And I have a cherry farm in Sarak mountain. How many of you been, ever been to Sarak mountain in Korea? We call Sarak San. How many of you been, been to that Sarak mountain? It's a, one of the most beautiful mountains in Korea. Anyways, so I have a apple farm in Sarak Mountain, oh, sorry, the, the cherry farm. And then also I have an apple farm too. I have apple farm in Yangji because I live in Yangji and the, my own house, in front of my own house, I have apple farm. Okay, I have a two farms. One is a cherry farm. One is apple farm. Cherry farms, 
located in Serak Mountain, and then Cheribam located very near my own town, Yangji. So now I give them job description, job to do to you all 11 workers. I said to you, I said to them, you go and harvest the cherry at Serak Mountain within a week. I gave you clear time timeline. Go and harvest cherry at Serak Mountain within a week. And next instruction, no need harvest the apple at Yangji yet. Otherwise, don't harvest apple yet. It's not ready. So I sent, I gave you clear instruction. You go and uh, within a week time, no longer, within a week time, go and harvest a cherry at Sarak Mountain. Don't, don't harvest the apple in my garden, Yangji. I gave you clear instruction. Then, 11 of you gather together as a labor. You said, well, seems to be, seems to be, Sarak Mountain is too far to go. It's just too far to go from here, from Yangji. It's too far. And then the road is too rough. It's, to go there is a very difficult road. So you decide, well, let's harvest the apple here in Yangji instead. We don't need to go to Sarak Mountain for a cherry harvest, but let's do it apple here. But you have clearly, you have instructions what you're supposed to do. You are supposed to go to the Sarak mountain and harvest there what within a week time. But you, you people, you laborers, you felt, well, it's too far. The road is too, too rough. So we better do it here, Yangji. So you went to apple farm. All of you, you went to Apple Farm at Yangji and you did, you worked hard, you worked hard. You know, you picked apple everywhere, you picked, and then you brought the apple to your, to me. And then you said, well, Lord Biancook, Master Biancook, we have worked hard and we have picked your apple and we brought it here. But obviously, this apple is not ready. I gave you clearly, don't go. Don't do the harvest apple, apple. Don't pick the apple yet. But you yourself, you went out and you picked apple, which is not ripe. And then, because we didn't go, you didn't go to harvest for cherry farm. So the cherry dropped because of timeline. One week, after one week, all the cherry dropped and they rotten like this. Now, my question, you worked hard. Of course you worked hard. I know you worked hard, but did you do right work or you did wrong work? It's clearly, you worked hard but you did not do what the master give you order according, not according to the master's harvest plan. You did by yourself. This is very, very funny story, but you just, you brought this unripe apples, which is not useless, Use, it's just rubbish. You brought it and you ruined my apple farm. You ruined my cherry farm because you did not harvest it. You worked hard, but you did not do according to my harvest plan. Now, 
Hard work is you can you work hard, but you did not do right work. That's the that's the matter. You worked hard, but the not right work. Well, she just sent workers to every town and place where he himself was going to go. You know, so. We, you and me, we are supposed to work. We are supposed to give our time, our energy, our effort, according to Jesus' harvest plan. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the good news to every human being, every nation, every people on earth. That was. But some place, too many Christians, too many workers, imbalance. Some place, too many Christians overpopulated. Some place crying for workers. Some places we've never heard good news. Is there anyone who can come and deliver good news to us? People are crying. But the many people, they just do. You see, someplace too many pastors. Someplace too many pastors. But someplace no pastors. Someplace too many churches. But someplace no church. And uh, this is in whole world, full state church workers including pastors and evangelists and missionaries. Full status, workers means workers for the, for the Lord, for kingdom of God. Almost 92% of full status workers are working on Christendom, where the Christian highly populated place. And 7.5%, they're only working non-Christendom. And then, 0.7, even less than 1% of poor status workers, they were only working on rigid people, means on evangelized, on rigid people area. As we've been working with uh, international seminary students in Korea or Bible college students in Korea, especially from foreign you know, students, they came to Korea because the, the church, home church, many, many Christian leaders, many, many churches, they sent, they encouraged that person, you go and you go to Korea and learn theology there and come back and be effective workers for our nation. And when they finished, they didn't go back. They did not go back. They stay in Korea because in Korea, we don't need workers we, because in Korea, too many workers. But some people staying after they finished the MD or PhD or MA, THM. When they finish, they did not go back to work. They, they stay in Korea be, instead. I don't, we've, been, we've been raising Christian. What is your purpose? Are you workers of Christ? I really. Christ worker, do you really serving the Lord? We just keep asking. Do you people, you check yourself, make sure yourself, make sure who is Jesus to you? And uh, are you the Lord's harvest worker? You just make sure you just examine yourself. Are you the Lord's harvest worker? Or just working by yourself. You are studying the ages, there's seminary students, but before you go for the next step, check yourself, examine yourself every day. Am I who Jesus is to me? Who is Jesus to me? Am I the Lord's harvest worker? Am I doing according to his service plan? 
this is very important, crucial question to you. And uh, do it, am I, am I doing it according to his harvest plan? This is you and me, we need check, daily checkup. We need a daily checkup. Am I doing his harvest plan? Or am, am I doing my own way? Like what you know, somebody like you did go and harvest the unripe apple. You ruined my apple farm. You didn't go to the harvest my cherry farm. You ruined my cherry farms. But still you said, I'm your workers. You employed me. I'm, your, I'm working for you. I worked hard. Yes, of course you worked hard. But it's not right work. Not according to your master's plan. That's what Jesus makes sure. You, you go, you go to where? To every town and place where I'm about to go, you go. Jesus did not say, okay, you guys, you go wherever you want. No, he didn't say that. Jesus says, you people, you go. The place where I'm going to. He sent you and me. The place where he himself was about to go. That's what Bible tried to make sure because we are his servant. We are his worker. He's our Lord. He's a master of harvest. He's a harvest master. He's harvest the Lord. So we must follow his harvest plan. Okay. Priority. Now, I'm going to lordship and priority. Well, uh, Daniel, he knows I used to work in Gambia. Well, as a Korean, going into Gambia, well, after many years later, I love Gambia, but initial was it wasn't. But anyway, the time I committed myself to go to mission, to become a missionary. The firstly, we shared our vision with my parents and especially my mother. You see, she was the first believer in the whole town. And uh, I, I still remember when she came to, when she went to church and there was people mocked at her and especially my father, he really, you know, gave her hard time. I remember she was in a sense, she was really badly persecuted by many ways. Of course, my father, later on, he became Christian too. But initially, when my, when my mother became Christian, it was very, very hard. But anyways, the time when I entered theological seminaries, that became great joy to my mother. My mother was so proud of, you know, she was she proud of me. She said, wherever she went, she said, you see, my son is going to become pastor. My son is going to become a pastor. I'm going to be mother of pastor, she said. And she, you know, she all, always, she said, when you become pastor, I will be praying mother for you. I will be praying for you in your church, day and night. It was her desire and her hope. Then when I finished my theological seminary, I shared to my mom, I said, mother, I'm going to become a missionary. She said, what? You mean, are you going away from me? Are you going out from Korea? Going far, far away from me. She was so shocked. Was too, she was really shocked. And she persuaded me with the tears and again and again said, my son, even in Korea, there are so many places to work. Even in Korea, there are so many places where there's no church. Why don't you go then work in Korea? Don't go away from us. Don't go to abroad as a mission. She really persuaded me. It was very, very hard with the tears. That time, I really, really strongly, strongly, you know, understood why Jesus said, anyone who loves his father and 
mother more than me is not worthy of me. Priority. Of course, I loved my mother. I respected my mother. I respect my parents. But to me, at that time, Jesus was my top priority. Jesus was everything to me. Today, when Jesus was walking, somebody came to him saying that, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go and bury my father first. Then I will come back and I will follow you. What did Jesus say to him? Okay, okay, no problem. Go and bury your father and come back later. No, he didn't say that. Jesus clearly said, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the good news. Other words, don't go. Your priority is proclaiming this good news. Your priority is to say this good news to other people. Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and do my work. This is priority. Jesus tried to make sure. Do you really want to follow me? Do you really want to work for me? Then your priority is to proclaim the good news. This is more important than anything else. Even your father and even your mother. That's why Jesus said anyone who, lo who loves his father and mother, who loves her father and her mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's a clear. You and me, as long as we understood, you and me, we have decided to follow Jesus Christ. In other words, we have decided to work for the sake of Christ throughout all our lives. This is our duty. This is our job. This is our priority. And uh, now, the time we set up, we, we left Korea to become missionaries. My children, I have two girls, and the people raising question, can you, can you go out with your children? Can you, go, can you take your children to Africa? People just keep asking, asking. And even my, my parents, and my relatives, and my brothers, they keep, you know, rebuking or insulting or mocking at us. And then some people worrying world, can you take your children to Africa? There was the occasion. And uh, that's why Jesus gave us long time ago, he gave us warning. Anyone who loves his or her son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his or her daughter, her son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Priority. What is our priority? What is your priority? You become full-time workers. I mean, in other words, you, work, you become workers for the, for the Lord throughout your lives. So make sure Jesus is everything to you. He is above all, all priority of your life. Jesus wants to make sure this. He wants to really make sure about this. And the next one, Jesus tried to make us placement. He said, again, go back to chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he himself was going to go. Now, placement. Well, like myself, of course, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I became, you know, Gambian lover, but initially 
it was really, really difficult time when we came, after we became work missionaries. So we encouraged to go down Africa. It was 1985. I wanted to go down as a, you know, exploring trip. I left my family back into UK. And then I went to, you know, have an exploring trip to Gambia. I want to know what kind of country before I take my children, my family down to Africa. So it was 1990, 1985, April, I went to Gambia. So the, as, a, as a plane approaching Gambia International Airport, the pilots give announcement, ladies and gentlemen, our plane is approaching Banjul International Airport. Daniel, he just, you just used this airport, same 1985 and then 2020, the same airport. It's the same place. And uh, our, our plane landed into this, you know, airport. The time I stepped out from the plane and I stepped on the ground, it was burning hot. It's just not only scorching hot, it's a burning. It was just burning, it was April. I've never had, I had never had that kind of scorching heat throughout my life till that time. It was really like, like a fire. Then suddenly I talked to myself, I think I have come wrong place. I have come wrong place. But I could not go back immediately because I only booked my ticket. I have to stay in Gambia three weeks. So that they took me to the house, missionary home in Sibanol, you know. Daniel, he knows. They took me from airport to this house. It was missionary house. There was missionary, German missionary was living there. After I entered this house, everything was hot. Chair, bed, floor, wall, everything was hot, just hot. I didn't know what to do. I almost like, a, I, I became beside myself. And I, I regret and regret, why did I come here? This is not my field. This is not my field. And I blamed to myself again and again. But there was no way to you know, return immediately. I had to be there at least for three weeks. So that daily, every day, Daniel, I don't know whether you understood or not, but every day, my life. Wow, it was the longest time of my life. When I wake up in the morning, I talk myself, how can I be survived today? So every day I marked calendar. When one day passed, I marked it. When, two, when another day passed, I marked and marked and marked. I had to be there for 21 days. It was the longest time of my life. And I, every day I made sure again and again, this is not my field. I will never come back to this place anymore. I will never come back. Once I go back to Britain, I will never come back here. That's all. So time passed. Finally, it came to the last day of staying, 21st, last day, 1985, April. So 20, 21st day, last day. I wake up early in the morning. I ask my friend, Please take me to the airport. My friend said, my friend, your plane will be departured night, night time. Even though you go to the airport, there's no plane. But I begged him again, again, please take me to the airport. So finally he agreed. He took me airport in the afternoon. I was there in the airport. Of course, in, in even airport by that time, now there's a, I think, Daniel, nowadays in the Gambia airport, air conditioned, but 1985, there was no air condition at all. 
airport. It was so hot. But anyway, my heart, well, even a few hours later, I will fly back to UK, then finish. Gambia is over. That was my, once I go back to UK, I will never come back here. It was my decision. I'm, I made my decision clearly. I will never come back here. It was my decision. Then I was waiting for the waiting hall in the Gambia, Banjul Airport. Oh my goodness. Whilst I was there, I was sitting there. I was sitting there, but the Lord clearly reminded me. I, I had a sense that the Lord was speaking to me. I had a clear sense the Lord was speaking to me. My dear, you have come here by airplane, nonstop from Britain to here. Did you not know that 100 years ago, the missionary from US all the way from US and sailed the rough Pacific Ocean, not only seven hours, four months. And they came to Korea and they delivered good news and they buried their body in your country. Did you not know that? So I submit myself simply of course, that was not me, but I just like, like that, Lord, I will be back, okay? And as soon as I confessed this, tears, tears was pouring out from my eyes. And uh, I, I, kept, I kept asking, why me, Lord? Why, why, why do we have to come here? What about my, my, my daughters? What about my wife? As a family, how could we survive here? It was my prayer and my, you know, anguish. And then all the way back to UK, and I cried and cried and cried. And when I back to UK, my wife and my two, two girls, they welcomed me saying, honey, welcome back from Africa. And my two girls, daddy, welcome back from Africa. And my wife, she said, I was Africa. I said, well, Africa was good. And she said, was it not hot? I said, well, it was bearable, it was okay. And my two girls, they were jumping and jumping. Wow, we're going to Africa. And uh, well, we left our last will and testament in our mission, UK, in the event of our, we actually, that time, we thought we would die. Daniel, now it's okay. But at that time, we thought we would die in Africa. So we wrote our last will and uh, we left our, you know, the hair sample and fingerprint and we left it back. And uh, we went down to Gambia as a family. And it was August. Wow. Once we arrived in the Gambia, it was a challenge. And uh, this lady, Korean lady, she changed like a Gambian lady. And uh, it's the same lady. She just like African lady. And this man, he, this is, a, he's a fashion, everyday fashion. It was because it was so hot. And, uh, and uh, even while we were eating, still he was half naked and especially my girls, my two girls, every initial few months, every mosquito, mosquito bitten place, they get boiled. We don't know why. Every mosquito eyes and legs and bodies and arms everywhere. Mosquito bite, you know, become boiled. And you can see my, my first daughter's body. It's a, <coughs> everywhere, mosquito bitten. And uh, we, all our family, we get malaria. We didn't know what to do. And then all our family, same time, same time, myself and my wife, two of my kids, all of us, we get malaria. And the local people, 
Gambians are very, very kind people. They're very tender heart and kind people. Our neighbors, they came and uh, they, you know, show, showed us their sympathy and they said, why do you live here? You are not Gambians. Why do you live here? What, what on earth you are? You have come our country and you are taking this suffering. People kept asking with the tears. What was our question? It was simple. We, we answered them, well, the Lord has placed us here. The Lord has sent us here. We come by his calling and we come by sending. We are here because the Lord, our Jesus Christ, he sent us, he placed us here. Now, you and me, we are Lord's workers. You and me, we are supposed to work where he wants us to go. We are supposed to work where, what he wants us to work. Not your own will, not our own will. No matter where it is, no matter what kind of work it is, no matter how difficult road it is, no matter how far there is, we are supposed to work. We are supposed to go according to his will, according to his plan. That's what Jesus make you and me. He want to make sure before we start our work. Do you really my work? Do you really my servant? Are you really my laborers? Are you really ready to work for me? Are you really work for according to my harvest plan? That is you and me. That question goes to you and me. Well, I think my time, the first session is already over. So but anyway, this session I'm going to start with a, I'm going to share with the provision or laws providing for his workers. Uh, you see, if you go to Bible, many places, one, one, one subject, Jesus keep, Jesus emphasizing again and again. You have to, we really have to make sure this part. If you go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 9 to 10, what Bible says, do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belt for your missionary journey. Do not take along any gold and silver or copper in your belts for your missionary journey. And then if you go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, same word, take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a stop. That's what Bible says. And if you go to Mark chapter 8, still take nothing for the journey except a stop. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandal, but not an extra tunic. Wow, this is very interesting. And then if you go to Luke chapter 9, Take nothing for the journey except a stop. No bread, no bag, no money, no extra tunic. If you go to Luke chapter 4, chapter 10, verse 4, do not take a purse or a bag or sandal. Of course, it's one occasion Jesus gave this order, these uh, lessons, but the different uh, the gospels they wrote, their, their ways. But anyways, Four different places, five different places, focusing one subject. Take no money, take no bag, take no extra tunic, take no extra clothes. This is very unique, unique. I mean, other words, God's provision or care. You see, like myself, like a Jeff, as a Korean healthy young man, when they come for some later or some later teens or 18s, then some, anyway, 
in the young youth time, we are mandatory, we are compulsory to serve as a military service. Two years, my time, we did three years, but nowadays only two years. It's a all mandatory service because we have to you know, serve for the, for the nation. So now, when you go to, when you become a military service or we are called by the state, other words, we belong to the state. We are property of the state, exist for the state. In other words, we are called by Korean government. We, we belong to the Korean government. We belong, we are property of Korean government. We existing, we are existing for all the soldiers existing for the Korean nations. That is our, I mean, our being and our, the, you know, the reason to serve. And then because of that, because of that Korean government, they provide all uniform, of course, free uniforms and free, sho free shoes and the socks and underwears and even some snacks, I mean, cigarettes, free. Government provide all our needs. And uh, even nowadays, government, of course, our time, they didn't give much, but nowadays, monthly, almost $500 as a pocket money, every soldiers. And vacation and bonus too. And then we just, we bring same, simple case. Why, why do the, why do Korean government provide all this? Why, what is the reason? Why? All the soldiers, every soldiers, government provide all the necessities, money and uh, tunics or socks and uniforms and shoes, everything. Why? Because we are belong to our government. We working for Korea, not for ourselves. We are called from the nation from the government, it's a mandatory. All Korean, as long as we are Koreans, foreigners, no, but as long as we are Koreans, we are, we are going to serve two or three years as mandatory service. So when Jesus says, do not take purse, do not take extra clothes, do not take extra sandals, do not take a bag, do not take any cooper or coins, Otherwise, now in, in current you know, terms, don't take money. Wow. What does it mean? Not only one place. Every gospel day, there's a you know, quote, this, this verse. Don't take money. Don't take you know, this, this. What is the reason why? Because once we are called by the Lord, the Lord is our provider. He will take care of us. Otherwise, we trust because once we go to soldier, military service, we don't worry about tomorrow what we are going to eat. Tomorrow or today, what we are going to wear. No, we don't worry because government will provide all our needs. Well, my underwear, what do I wear? My what underwear? Don't worry, government will provide all our needs: shoes and food, even snack, everything. Come on, provide. Why? Because we're working for Korea, Korean government, Korean, our nation. Same way. Once we called by the Lord, Lord is our provider. I will give you total care. You just full trust of me. You fully trust in me because you are working for me. I have called you. You are called by me. So we are God's servants. Jesus is 
our provider. God is our care. Jesus wants to make sure this important part. Well, as I shared about my, my family, of course, we family, we committed ourselves to become missionaries. So after we decide, after we get calling, for, calling as a missionary, I shared to my home church leadership. Well, pastor, as I've been sharing about now it's time for us to go mission field. Now we have to go. And then pastor, senior pastor of my church, he said, brother, I understood. We all understood. We understand your calling. No doubt. All our church members, they know that you're, you're going to become mission. We know that, but not now. We can't send you now because we have Build, we have a make a big church building constructions. So we had a huge bank, bank debt. So we have to pay it back. So it will take approximately two or three years. After two or three years, we will support you as a sending church. It was a simple, clear deal. But my heart, my heart was burning, you know. I said, well, pastor, I cannot delay my time. I must go now because the, as, as young as young as possible, I must go. And I have to preach the good news to other nations. I must go. And then my senior pastor was a bit upset with me. He said, brother, I told you. I clearly explained to you why we cannot serve you, why we cannot support you now. If you go, if you go now, clearly my church, we may not be able to support you at all. Do you understand? I said, yes, pastor, I understand. I understood, but I cannot delay it. The Lord will help me. So pastor was quite upset. Okay, then go ahead. By your own way, just go away. But my church, clearly, we cannot, we may not support you at all. This is finished. So, well, that time, all of, all my possession, and uh, I don't know how much airfare it was. I don't know how much the balance, but how, how much, but anyway, when I arrived in UK, in my pocket, in my pocket, exactly 300, 3,500, 3,500, five, 500 dollars. That's all we had as a family, four. And then support from Korea, none, no support. So we went to Britain for training and study, but having money as a family, $3,500 in our pocket. That was all. So we arrived in London Heathrow Airport as a family, friend of mine who studied in UK, he came to meet us in the airport. When he saw my family, was very shocked. He said, oh, my friend, have you come as a whole family? I said, yes. Then he re-asked me, have you brought enough money? I said, not, not really. <laughs> then he said, how much money you have? Well, I said, well, around a little bit over $3,000. $3, he was really, really shocked. My friend, this is Britain. If you don't have money, you cannot be survived here. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Well, well, I have no word. I was just quiet. And he said, from here, where are you going? I said, well, I don't know. Where do I go? And this man is so upset. And you are, you are stupid. You are crazy. You are ridiculous. And then he said, anyway, let's go out. 
So he took us to his house, Wembley Alperton, you know, his oh, simple flat. He was, he rented the Indian family, you know, upstairs, he, he rented that house. He took us to his, his humble, you know, flat. And uh, he looked my family and uh, he said, well, you come as a family. So he gave us his bed. It's a regular double bed. He gave us his, his bed for us to use. And he moved, you know, attached a small room. He moved the other corner room. And uh, we four of us, my wife and my, my two girls, we never, before we, we entered it, we never ever slept on the bed. You know, in Korea, we don't sleep on the bed from our time. We were sleep on the floor, you know, clean, you know, warm floor. We slept. We never, we never slept on the bed before. And but there was only one bed. It was November. It's cold, quite chilly weather in Britain. And we had only one blanket, no heater. It was a simple, you know, bed. And the we don't know how to sleep. So first night, we slept this way. But it was a, too cramped. It was too narrow, you know. And, uh, we slept, etch, and then my children slept in, the, in, the, in between. But it was a, too, too cramped. We could not have good sleep during the night. And then following night, we changed different way. We slept this way. But problem is my leg was too, too long and my leg was, you know, out of the blanket, out of the bed. So that night also we couldn't sleep it. And uh, third night, okay, let's change different way. So third night we slept this way. Two of us, we slept that direction. Two of my girls, you know, slept the other direction. So we slept. But middle of night, because we not, none of us, all of us are not used. So middle of night, you know, because you know, undeliberately, I kicked my girls from the bed. And my, my girl, she, she dropped from the bed. She dropped on the floor. And she shook and she cried and screamed in the night. And uh, I, I wake up and I put her bed. And I said, I knelt by the bed, and I ask, Lord, I'm in desperate. I'm here all by our Lord. My money is getting less and less. I have no, no support from Korea. Lord, I need your help. I was desperate praying, Lord, I need, I desperate for you. Day and day and night day. You see? There was our life, but not only one month, not only 10 months, not only one year, for three years, no support came from Korea, but for three years, we don't know how, how did we, how were we you know, survived? The Lord provide all our needs. We were survived, not only survived, we were able to study for three years in UK. And that time we become so, so bold. Wow. The Lord is our provider. Lord is our provider. And he will provide all our needs. So in our mission, we have a very unique mission polish. I don't know whether you heard about this. Our mission, I'm, I'm working as a WEC, you know, you know, in WEC mission organization. And uh, in WEC, all WEC missionaries, we have a one unique kind of uh, attitude toward finance. So we are not, you know, asking for money, any human being, even though I don't have money, but I, we are not, supposed to ask or appeal anybody to help financially support. 
and uh, we all bring in to the Lord. Lord, you know our situation. You know my situation. You know our, our church situation. So we all asking to the Lord, not appeal to human being. That is a web mission policy. So Daniel, you know, this clinic, WEC Sibanur Clinic. Now we hand it over to ECG Church. Now, Sibanur Clinic is a, is a local clinic, but it's big, large patients are coming daily. 100, 100 patients are coming for this clinic. And uh, I don't remember the year, but many, many years ago, to operate this clinic with uh, so many patients, lots of, lots of money, you know, finance need. So we always, you know, get financial aid from international financial aid agencies like a World Vision or, you know, like that. So till that year, World Vision, they provided quite large amount of money for medication, medicines for the patients for running this clinic. But that year, World Clinic, uh, World Vision, they sent us important notice saying that in a few months' time, our contract is over. Our contract is finished. So we, we cannot you know, re, re contract again because we have other important, other urgent you know, project we have to run. So the finance will not continue after two months. It was a big news and then it was quite, quite big challenge to us. We didn't know what to do. If we don't have that money come from World Vision, we certainly we are not able to operate this clinic. It was a huge challenge. And then all our mission is we, okay, let's pray for this clinic. Let's, for, let's pray for the finance. So we all pray. Of course, that time I was not there. And all our mission, they prayed and prayed and prayed. Not, not letting anybody know, not report anybody outside, but only uphold this matter to the Lord. Lord, you know our situation. You know our clinic. Without having that money, we may be very difficult to operate this clinic, Lord, help us. We prayed and prayed. And two or three weeks later, nobody knew what was going on in this clinic. But two or three weeks later, we get a letter from UK. There was a tier fund organization, you know, that also kind of financial aid organization. Tier fund agency, you know, the they sent us letter, just inquiry. Well, we have uh, some uh, available finance. So would you need any financial help? If then, let us know. We'll be happy to help you financially. Because they, don't, they didn't know what was happening to us. We only prayed. But the Lord touched their heart and they just start up. The Lord start, start them up and they just voluntarily they ask us. But we need, desperate we need. So it's, of course we need, we need the financial support. So two weeks later, from exactly two months later, TF Fund, they start to support accordingly for this clinic. We, from the beginning till our ministry, or most of, I would say, most of work ministry, work research, we've been keeping this polish, these principles. The Lord is our provider. He will provide all our needs. He knows our situation more than anyone else. He is our provider. So this is, that's why Jesus said, when you go out, when you go for journey, when you go, when you go to mission field, 
You don't need to worry about your finance. You don't need to worry about your clothes. You don't need to worry about your food. Why? Because I am your provider. I will provide all your needs. Well, I don't know the, the, the Sunil, you, you said you're from uh, India, but actually nowadays some new workers from different countries, like a former mission field, like uh, some African country, they, they start to send out missionaries. So the Philippines, they start to send out missionaries and the Vietnamese, they start to join, you know, some Vietnamese join our organization and there's some even the Burmish, the Myanmar people from Myanmar, they start to join our organization and there's some like Egyptians, they, they start to join, they, they have joined our organization. And of course, Indian too, and the Romanians, and then Indians, some quite Indians, they're joining us. And then like country, like, you know, this is India, of course, the Sunil you know about. And uh, mainland India, but we, we, we could not cover it all because India is too big. So we only, for, for the time, we only cover it Northeast India, you know, the small part of the East, Northeast part of India. We only focus in that area. So for that small states, since we start to, you know, recruit Indians into our organization, 2016, we had 14 new Indians. 2017, we have a nine new Indian now from the Northeast India. And uh, 2018, we have 23 Indians from Northeast India. And 2019, 21 Indians from Northeast India. And uh, because of COVID, 2020, we could not run the course, but 2021, this year, June, we have new uh, 12, 12 new, in, new, new you know, workers from India. And then possibly this year, autumn, from September, we may have uh, another 25 Indians to join us. And then mostly all those countries, India, Philippines, Vietnam, Romania, Egypt, Burm, Myanmar. It's a one challenge. Most of those kind of Africans too. Most of those challenges, they say, we are struggling with the financial support. Finance is a big challenge. We can, we, yeah, we want to send missions, but finance is a big challenge. Like African church, if you want to send missions, but we don't have money to send missions. Filipino churches, we have mission, but we sending finance is a challenge. Of course, Indian church too. We want to send mission, but finance is a big challenge. We don't have enough finance to send our mission. Well, we, we sent, some years ago, we sent three Indian missionaries to Thailand. And, uh, you know, when they, when they enter mission field, one of them, one lady, she only support, monthly support was 175 US dollars. That was all she get from India. And the, another, girl, another lady, she only get $76 a month. She went, she sent, she went as a missionary, but she was only get, and then another man, he's only 400 to get. $430 receiving from his home church. Especially two lady missionaries, that's 175, 176, that's less, two less, it's two less. But they trust in the Lord. Even though my home church, they don't have enough money, only they are able to support this much money, but we don't worry about it. We will trust in the Lord. So they went, we sent, they went to mission field with that amount of money. Faithful God, the Lord provide all their needs. The Lord provide all their needs. Now, after four years past, the supporting is raised up. Maybe more than that, actually. They support 
The Lord provide different ways. They survived. And uh, even though when, when they beginning, they were very low, but the Lord provide all their needs. So they become very bold. And then they have pictures. Even though we didn't bring pearls, we didn't bring extra clothes, we didn't bring extra sandal, we didn't bring big bag, but Lord provide all our needs. That is what Lord wants us to do. The Lord wants us to trust in him. You yourself, you will be faced very soon when you go back. When you do for next ministry, you will confront this challenge. You will certainly con confront these challenges. And then do not forget, the Lord is your provider. The Lord will provide all your need. He will provide all your need. So this is matter of faith. So we call faith mission. The Lord is our provider. Even though my church, even my friend, even my family, they are not able to support me. They are not, they are not able to go with me. But the Lord is supporting me. The Lord is my supporter. That's, that is a faith. Jesus wants to make sure, even though you don't, do not take money, but I will provide. Do not take extra clothes. Don't worry. I will, I will buy clothes for you. Trust in the Lord. Having that attitude, that is a principle to be a servant of Christ. Whether you're working in your own country, whether you're working abroad, but that is a principle you need to keep. Because that was Jesus teaching clearly. Matthew, Mark, Luke, different places, same principle. Jesus keeps saying that. Do not take. Do not take, do not take this, do not take this means don't worry about this, don't worry about this, don't worry about this. It's the same word. I am sending you. I am the one who sent you. I am sending you. You are going out by my name. I am sending you. That's why do not worry about. It. My people, my friend, please take note of this. This is very, very important principle you need to keep. Once you lose it, you will get confused. You will, you will, you will lose everything. That's why keep this principle because this is biblical word, not my word. Jesus clearly says, you don't need to worry about this, this part. I am you provider. So, the last one I'm going to share about this protection. Jesus says, chapter 10, verse 3, I am sending you out like a lamb among wolves. That means when you go out, there will be everywhere, everywhere there will be wolves. There will be everywhere there's the dangers, you know, dangers everywhere because you whether you're working in your own country, whether you're going abroad, it's the same. Dangers are everywhere. Dangers from neighbors, dangers from the wilderness, dangers from enemies, dangers from other religions. Dangers everywhere. And the difficulties everywhere. And, uh, but make sure Jesus says, I am sending you out. You know, I am sending you out. In other words, Jesus, he has sent us out his work. He is our Lord. Clearly said, I am not your church, not our organization, not your friend, not your family. Jesus, I am sending you out. Do you believe that? Jesus is sending you out. He is sending you out. Like lamb among the wolves. Means Jesus is sending you out in the middle of difficulties, in the middle of dangers, in the middle of you know, all dangers and the challenges. He is sending you out. But never mind, don't worry. 
I am your care. I am your protector. I am your Lord, Almighty God. I am your protector. You don't need to worry about it. I will take care of you. Not only financially, but from the danger, from the difficulties, I will take care of you. Well, Daniel Chata, you know this lady. Do you, don't you, Daniel? Daniel from Gambia. Daniel Bemito. I know her, Alon and Alon, and the Adama. <laughs> yeah, Alon. Alon the Bakifa. <laughs> Adama. Well, she was a full uh, the, the world of lady, world of girl, when, when she firstly met us. Of course, she was strong, strong Muslim family background. And uh, as she came to my house, and uh, we start to communicate months and months and months. And then she started to read the Bible and she started to learn about Jesus Christ. And then finally, she believed in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, she became strong Christian. And she confessed her faith by her own mouth, you know, and she really confessed and she prayed together. And then one day she came to us, said, Mr. As I become a Christian, there's no reason for me to delay, but I won't become, I won't be baptized. I said, Adama, that's good. Yes, you need it. Let's, let's do it. So we said, Adama, but even though, yes, you are baptized, but before you baptize, you better, you better go and inform your family. You better go and tell your family you're going to be baptized. And she said, oh, Mr. My parents, they're strong Muslims. If they knew that, they would kill me. I said, no, don't worry. Better inform them before you be, before, before you're baptized. So she was a bit reluctant and hesitate. And we prayed, she prayed a couple of days. Then one day, it was around nine o'clock in the evening. She came to me, she said, Mister, tonight I'm going to tell my parents that I'm going to be baptized. I said, okay, Adama, go and do it. Go in peace. So I prayed for her and she left. And we went to bed. It was midnight. I was in the, in the bed and suddenly I heard somebody knocking my door, harshly knocking my door. I came out from the bed. I came to my door. Oh my goodness, outside there was a lady stood. Was the one lady standing up? Was Adama, half naked, covered by sand and blood, everywhere. And I opened my door, and she just ran, ran into my bathroom. I didn't know what happened. Blood everywhere, and then covered by sand everywhere. And uh, a few minutes later, a group of people came to my house. They opened my door widely. It was her father and her mother and her uncle. Three, four people came. They asked me, where is she? I just realized what was happened. Then I could not say any word. I lost my word. I just kept quiet. And they kept asking, where is she? We know she's here. And I said, I don't know. And they kept asking, asking, where is she? They tried to come in. I said, no, they couldn't come in my house. And they kept asking, you know, to hand over her to, to them. I didn't. And then almost one hour later, they went back. And then I locked my door again. And I, I called my, this girl from the toilet. And I, we, gave, we, we, we gave her our own club. And then I asked Adam, what happened? She said, well, last night I went home. And there was around four or five people sitting on the ground and talking, chatting. And I stood before them and I quietly and solemnly expressed to them, said that 
mom and dad, I have something to tell you. And the parent says, what's up, Adama? And she said, well, I don't know whether you have observed. Now I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Now I become a Christian. Because of that, I'm going to be baptized. As soon as she said that much, her father stood up and he, he smacked with his hand with all his strength. And he, she slapped her and she fell on the ground. And then his fa her father started stamp, you know, trampling her and her uncle and her auntie and her mom, all of them, they trampled, trampled her. And she screamed and screamed and screamed. And then her brother came, younger brother came, high school boy, he came and he opened his arms and he's pushing his parent and his grandmother and uncle. He, he pushed it with all his strength and pushed them back and then released her from their hands. And she ran, ran, ran to my house. She ran, ran to my house. And then there was that the happening. Wow, it was really scary. It was really, really scary, you know? And uh, following day, we locked our door and uh, Adam also stayed at my house and we said, do not go out today. Just stay at home, all of you, all my family, stay at home today. So whole day, nothing happened. Up, pretty quiet, no problem. So. That night, second night, we all went to bed. And the middle of the night, again, a quite large group of people approaching to my house. I heard of that. And when I woke up and I came to the door, around 20 people came to my house with her father, mother, brother, uncle, all of them, even neighbors. All of them came to my house and uh, they, didn't, they did not ask me to give this girl back to them, but they start to cursing at me. They start to curse at me. You have come to my country. You have brought wrong, you know, false religion to my people and you have deceived my girl and you have deceived, you know, our people. And you have changed my girl from our traditional religion, Muslim, to Christianity. And uh, Almighty Allah will punish you. Almighty Allah will, you know, give you all kind of, you know, bad wishes, like uh, cursing at me. Almost one hour. And the while she, he, he, her father was cursing at me, just by him, her young uncle, only a few years older than her, he was standing by her. He was a very tough guy. He looked very sharp and the big, quite big body and a very tough guy. He was keep glancing at me. I was really scared of that man, not her father. Her father was not big man. And then I could even, you know, control him. But her younger uncle, he was quite sharp. I thought he was doing something bad to me. I was keep glancing at me too. And almost one hour, nothing happened. And they left, they, left. they went home. And uh, well, I thought I realized that things are getting worse and bad, bad and worse, bad to worse. So I locked all my door and the even window, I closed and rechecked all my door. And then I knelt down before the Lord. I was very scary. And then, Lord, things are happening here. I need your help, Lord. Lord, all around, we all in our family, we need your help. And I was praying and praying and praying and praying. In the middle of my praying, I heard somebody was, somebody was, knocking, you know, somebody's opening my door, my bed door, because I locked it. But somebody was opened my door. I, I turned my head. Oh my goodness. There 
that young uncle, her young uncle, he stood up there with a big African cutlass holding with that big cutlass, Fango. He was standing there. I become my body, suddenly my body numb. I could not move at all. I was just numb, all my body numb. And this man, her uncle, without giving any word, he just rushed to me and then he stabbed with this knife, my side. He stabbed me. And I felt he had something you know, coming to my body cold, and holding it. And they said, Lord, I am dying now. Lord, take my, take my soul. And please, Lord, take care of my family. And I'm holding this. I'm holding, holding my body. And then suddenly I wake up. Oh my goodness. I dodged up while I was praying. It was, it was just, I had a shot, you know, dream. I had a shot dream. I, I fell asleep, you know, while I was praying. It was, just, it was a kind of dream, a shot dream. I realized there was a vision. Oh, it's a so clear, so clear vision. I thought today I may be killed like this. So I was sitting down on the floor, on, on the you know, floor and then thinking, I think I will die today because the dream is so clear. And uh, I was sitting there, no prayer, just sitting there. And then, you know, almost, I don't know how many hours passed. And then suddenly I saw outside, it was early morning, dawn is approaching. Outside was you know, more early morning. And then it was around before seven o'clock, somebody was open my gate and then calling me, pastor, pastor. So there was this man. I think the Daniel, he knows this man, of course. Modu Kamara, he's a ECG pastor, but that time he was evangelist. He never come to my house. He did not know at all what happened last night. He opened my gate. He was calling me, Pastor. So I came to my door. I opened. He came to my house. I said, Modu, what brings you here? And he sat down my sofa. And he was sat down. He was sat. And he said, I said, Modu, what brings you here so early in the morning? And this man, said to me, Pastor, you know, in my village, there's a mad dog. I said, Modu, I'm not interested to listen about mad dog. Why are you here? And then he said, he didn't, he ignored my question. He keeps saying that, you know, that mad dog is so fierce and barking and, you know, very aggressive because that is mad dog. And then, I said, Modu, I'm not interested to listen about mad dog. Please, what is your what is your purpose to come this morning? And he just just keep ignoring. He said, you know, Pastor, even though that, that mad dog is so obvious, but nobody was bitten. You know why? Because the owner, he bound it with a you know metal wire. He bound it. And uh, even barking, barking, he's mad, but he cannot bite. And the next word, it was an amazing word. He said, Pastor, Muslims, they're barking like mad dog, but they cannot bite us. You know why? Because the Lord Jesus, he has bound them. Jesus prevailed them. Oh, you know, he did not know what happened to me last night. He did not know at all. But he came to me to inform me this. I realized the Lord has sent him to me that early in the morning. Because I was so scared. I was so, so scared. I was overwhelmed with, the, you know, the fears. 
But the Lord sent this man and the Lord spoke to me verbally that I could understand. Even the Muslim people, they bark like a mad dog, but they cannot bite us because Lord is our protector. Lord will protect you. That one, the Lord won't you know, tell me through this man. So by God's grace, this lady, this girl Adama, she baptized and uh, two years ago, 19, 2019, I visited Gambia. I preached the same church when, when I, where I met this lady. That Sunday, she was my interpreter. My sermon was different subject. But when I, when I knew that she was my interpreter, I additionally, I shared about, you know, this experience with, with about her. And she was, you know, you see, can you see that she was, you know, you know the tearing with, with crying when she recalling that story. Anyways, she now become a big leader, a good woman leader in, in, in the Gambia. But what I want to say, even that moment, even no one was around me, but the, my Lord, my God, is our protector. Even though that middle of fear, middle of horror, the Lord was there to protect us, to give us absolute peace from the heaven. And that's why Jesus says, I am sending you out. Like lamb among the wolves. That means you don't need worry. you don't need worry about your you 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 know you you know your way because Jesus has sent us and He is going with us. He's protecting us. He's keep protecting us. He will pro you know He will provide us and He will He will He will provide all our need. And uh, this is what Jesus keeps saying, keep informing us. We are as we are. His servant, you and me, we, as we are his servant, he has called us and uh, he will provide us, he will protect us, and he will guide us. And we are supposed to go where he wants us to go. And we are supposed to work where he wants us to work. Because you and me and Jesus, he is our Lord, he is our master. You and me, we are his servant, we are his laborer. So today, Wow, my time is already five minutes past. So anyway, when I, when I come back, when I go back to Korea, I promise I will come to you and I will sit with you face to face and we can share more about, because not this kind of through internet, but we can share verbally, more vividly, and more practically and share with you face to face. Okay. So, well, I think even though I, 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 have, I have eaten all your question time too. I don't know whether you have any question, but anyway, if you have any comments or questions, yeah, you can free to share or to raise questions. 